on world news tonight. Oppressive rule. Taliban contradicted itself as several human rights were violated just two days into their rule. Californian flames. The American West Coast enters into a fiery turmoil in the latest symptoms of wildfire spreading worldwide. Record-breaking cases. Both Japan and Australia report their highest number of COVID cases as vaccination rates are accelerated. Buzzing change. An 11-year-old takes it on herself to save our buzzy friends. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the latest updates on the Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Multiple people were killed and more than a dozen were injured in anti-Taliban protests in the Afghan city of Jalalabad as the militant group moved to consolidate Islamist rule and Western countries stepped up evacuations of diplomats and civilians. At least three people were killed in anti-Taliban protests in the Afghan city of Jalalabad on Wednesday. Witnesses said Taliban fighters opened fire during the protests against the militant group and that more than a dozen people were injured in the shooting. Video footage showed protesters carrying Afghanistan's national flag down the street and witnesses said the gunfire followed an attempt by local residents to install the flag at a square in the city 90 miles east of Kabul. The killings mar the Taliban's promises of peace following the militant group's rapid sweep into the capital and come as it tried to set up a government. Many Afghans are skeptical of the Taliban's promises, which included respecting the rights of women within the framework of Islamic law. Some said they could only wait and see. But in a recent interview, a senior Taliban leader told Reuters that Afghanistan would not be a democracy. Meanwhile, thousands of Afghans, many of whom helped U.S.-led foreign forces over two decades, are desperate to leave the country. Video obtained showed crowds running away from a Taliban fighter firing his gun in the air near people gathered outside Kabul airport on Wednesday as Western countries stepped up evacuations of diplomats and civilians. One Western official told that about 5,000 diplomats, security staff, aid workers and Afghan civilians have been evacuated from Kabul in the last 24 hours. One early evacuee, Afghanistan's president Ashraf Ghani, turned up in the United Arab Emirates, the Gulf state's foreign ministry said on Wednesday, after he fled the country on Sunday as Taliban fighters seized control of the capital. Despite promises by the Taliban to uphold human rights, Afghan women and girls who have won freedoms that could not have dreamt of under the last Taliban rule that ended 20 years ago are desperate not to lose them now. The Islamist militant movement is back in power. A group of Afghan women holding signs and protesting for their rights on the streets of Kabul. Women and girls in Afghanistan are desperate not to lose their freedoms now that the Taliban are back in power. Afghan activist Pashtana Durrani runs an organisation that provides access to learning materials for 7,000 girls, mostly in rural areas across Afghanistan. As for the in their first press conference in Kabul, the Taliban pledged to respect women's right to work and education but only within the framework of Islamic law. Women will be afforded all their rights. The UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, expressed cautious optimism about working with Taliban officials, citing their early expressions of support for girls' education. But many others remain sceptical. Several women were ordered to leave their jobs during the Taliban's rapid advance across the country, and activists say they want to see the Taliban held to account for any commitment. During their rule from 1996 to 2001, guided by Sharia, religious law, girls were not allowed to go to school, women could not work and had to wear burqas to go outside. Eyewitness accounts suggest that the evacuation situation of Afghans in Kabul looked like a scene straight out of a war movie. Afghans seeking asylum were stopped at the airport by the Taliban by shooting into the air and tarmac. 
The South Korean ambassador to Afghanistan described the evacuation from Kabul as like something you'd see in a war movie. People flocking to the airport tarmac amid the sound of gunfire and helicopters. Speaking to reporters on Wednesday, the ambassador said the evacuation of Koreans was really urgent because the Taliban took control of Kabul sooner than expected. Friendly countries held meetings twice a week to share local information, and all South Koreans were able to safely pull out thanks to their help. The ambassador and two Korean embassy staffers remain in the country after most Koreans were evacuated on Sunday to help with the evacuation of one last remaining Korean who was reluctant to get out because of his business. They were the very last Koreans to leave the country on board a military plane carrying U.S. citizens, people from other countries, and some Afghans. They were supposed to leave on Monday, but the plane could not take off due to a large number of Afghans flocking to the tarmac. It remains to be seen how the Taliban will act regarding international norms and human rights, which will greatly affect the international community, including South Korea, in deciding whether or not to recognize a new government. Diplomatic sources say it won't be easy for the Taliban to impose the kind of brutal rule as before because the international community has raised human rights awareness in Afghanistan, particularly for women and girls, during the past two decades. But sources did say the Taliban might use heavy-handed methods of tightening its control over the country. In Australia, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said that Australia evacuated 26 people from Afghanistan in its first rescue flight as Canberra moves to evacuate its citizens and those who worked with its military. Australia's first rescue flight from Afghanistan evacuated 26 people, according to Prime Minister Scott Morrison. The plane arrived in Afghanistan late on Tuesday to help rescue citizens and Afghans who have visas. Taliban fighters seized the capital, Kabul, on the weekend as US-led Western forces have been withdrawing. Morrison is under intense pressure to expedite the rescue of its citizens and Afghans that worked with Canberra during Australia's two-decade-long deployment. We were able to get our first flight in last night and, and enabling us to transfer also in key personnel from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Home Affairs and Defence to facilitate the evacuation of citizens, uh, residents and visa holders, uh, Afghan nationals from Kabul. This was the first of what will be many flights, subject to clearance and, and weather. Morrison also says another 250 military personnel would be sent to help with evacuations, though he didn't specify the number of Afghans who have been given visas after working for Australia. He noted that the security situation at the airport in Kabul had improved, with the help of US and UK troops on the ground of the airport. Flights were forced to stop on Monday when thousands of frightened Afghans swamped the tarmac, desperate for a flight out. More than 39,000 Australian military personnel served in Afghanistan as part of the NATO-led international force that fought the Taliban after they were ousted in 2001. 41 Australians were killed there. However, Morrison warned Tuesday Australia was unlikely to be able to help all of those who had helped them. Over in the US now, firefighters battled flames from the Caldo Fire east of Sacramento, California, with helicopters making multiple water runs from Jenkinson Lake. Other than a World News Special Correspondent, Nicola Sena Ratner reports now from New York City in the United States. Thick smoke wafted through El Dorado County about dense rough terrain that's been burning since the fire erupted over the weekend. The Caldo Fire, which has burned more than 53,000 acres and is zero percent contained, is one of many burning across the U.S. West as percent. An incendiary mix of strong, shifting winds and drought patch vegetarian stalked two of California's largest wildfires, with thousands of residents chased from their foothill and mountain homes in the Sierra Nevada range. The blazers swelled as state's largest utility, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, initiated deliberate power shutoffs to 48,000 homes and businesses across Northern California. PG&E said it acted to reduce 
the wildfire risk posed by possible and wind damage to transmission lines. The Dixie Fire, ranging since mid-July in the Route Sierra Nevada range northeast of San Francisco, grew more than by 30,000 acres to 635,000 acres of tinder dry June vegetarian. The Dixie Wildfire is the second largest ever recorded in California and the largest by far among the schools rolling across the western United States. In a highly indiscriminate summer, that experts see as of climate change. The fire has destroyed at least 1,200 homes and other structures. Another 16,000 buildings were lifted as threatened, with about 29,000 residents having to evacuate communities across the area. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back now looking at the COVID pandemic. New Zealand city streets were deserted as the country returned to life in lockdown for the first time in six months in a bid to halt any spread of the infectious Delta variant of COVID-19. New Zealand city streets were largely deserted Wednesday morning as the country returns to life under lockdown. After months of living virus free, New Zealand confirmed its first case of the highly contagious Delta variant in Auckland on Tuesday. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said Wednesday there were now at least 10 confirmed cases, including a fully vaccinated nurse from Auckland Hospital. She added that they are all linked to an original infection from just across the water. The second thing it tells us is that it has linked the current genome sequencing of cases in the New South Wales outbreak. Our case has originated in Australia. Most of the country will be under level four lockdown, the highest alert level for at least three days, while Auckland will stay under lockdown for a week. Panic buying erupted after it was announced on Tuesday, while schools and businesses scrambled to move online. New Zealand's last reported community case of COVID-19 was in February. Its citizens have been living without restrictions, although its borders remain largely sealed. Ardern has been praised for New Zealand's strict virus containment measures, but her popularity took a hit with the delayed vaccine rollout. Only a fifth of the country's five million people have been fully vaccinated so far. The U.S. government stated that it intends to make COVID-19 vaccine booster doses readily accessible as infections from the coronavirus Delta variant increase, citing research suggests that the immunization's protection diminishes over time. The U.S. government announced on Wednesday that it plans to make COVID-19 vaccine booster shots widely available to fully vaccinated individuals 18 and over starting September 20th. The move comes as COVID infections are on the rise in the U.S. due to the Delta variant, and data shows diminishing protection from the vaccines over time. Americans who have completed a two-dose inoculation of the Moderna or Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines at least eight months ago will be eligible for the third dose. But... Those who received the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine will have to wait on a booster for now, as more data is expected in the next few weeks. Top U.S. health officials said in a joint statement that booster shots initially will focus on health care workers, nursing home residents, and older people, among the first groups to be vaccinated in late 2020 and early 2021. According to CDC data, more than 72 percent of Americans 18 and older have received at least one vaccine dose, and nearly 62% are fully vaccinated. In recent weeks, several other countries also have decided to offer booster shots to older adults, as well as people with weak immune systems, including Israel, France, and Germany. Over in Australia, the nation recorded its highest ever number of daily COVID-19 cases as authorities rushed to vaccinate Sydney residents against the fast-moving Delta variant. For more on this, we have other than in our world news special correspondent Timothy Philip reporting now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Shinani. The nation recorded 754 cases, beating the previous record of 730 reported cases in August 2020 during Melbourne's second wave. Australia's biggest city of New South Wales reported its largest caseload since the coronavirus pandemic began, with 681 new cases of community transmission recorded. One new death was reported. 
Officials are racing to increase vaccination rates across New South Wales as a prerequisite for lifting lockdown measures in the state. Berejiklian has yet to formally extend the shutdown, which is currently due to end at the end of the month, but has made it clear that 70% of the state's population over the age of 16 must be vaccinated, a target she expects to reach by the end of October. Also of concern to health authorities is the rising number of people with COVID-19 requiring intensive health care. There are now 214 people with coronavirus in hospital and additional 31 people since Tuesday. Of those, more than 40 people are in intensive care units and more than half of them need ventilators to help them breathe. Back to you, Shanghai. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Now over in Japan, many parts of the world continue to grapple with the wave after wave of COVID-19, with Japan logging a fresh record high in daily cases, mostly fueled by the deadly and quick to spread Delta variant. After just five days, Japan has once again shattered its record daily number of new COVID-19 cases. The country confirmed 23,917 new cases on Wednesday, while 27 of Japan's 47 prefectures posted record figures. Tokyo reported its second highest daily tally with nearly 5,400 cases. The skyrocketing number of infections has also led to a shortage of hospital beds, with many people being urged to treat themselves at home if possible. Grappling with a surge, the Japanese government on Tuesday extended the state of emergency in the capital area and other regions and it vowed to exert every effort to fight the spread that's being fueled by the Delta variant. The Delta variant now accounts for nearly 99 percent of new infections in the U.S., dominating every other strain within just three months. Against its backdrop, U.S. health authorities are concerned about waning vaccine effectiveness against the strain. The proportion of Delta cases is also rising in Brazil, which has reported over 1,500 Delta cases as of Wednesday. Its health authorities say this is an 84 percent increase from the previous week. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A COVID case has been detected in the Tokyo Paralympics village just days before the Games are due to start. The person who tested positive to the virus is not an athlete and is not a resident of Japan. The 5th China Arab States Expo opened in Xinxuan city of northwestern China's Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region. Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory letter saying China is willing to jointly promote cooperation with Arab Emirates and seek for development. Fires were raging in Argentina's Cordoba province prompting evacuations and threatening to destroy homes. Cordoba's government warned of an extreme risk of fires throughout the province and amid the dry and windy weather. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani is speaking from exile in the United Arab Emirates that he had left Kabul to prevent bloodshed and denied reports he took large sums of money with him as he departed the presidential palace despite there being evidence. And finally tonight, most people are afraid of bees but not a young girl in Illinois, Chicago who's creating quite a buzz at the state house as she tries to save the bees. Just be super, super chill. Scarlett Harper is fearless especially when it comes to bees. Wow. This 11-year-old wants to get as close as she can. When Scarlett learned the bees in her neighborhood were being wiped out by mosquito pesticides, she rallied to save them. Go make some phone calls, get some state reps on board. Let's do this. Hold calling state lawmakers and working with them to write a bill aimed at limiting the use of harmful chemicals. Bees are completely vital to humans. They pollinate a third of our food supply, and without them, we really can't survive. Instead of thinking of my age as a disadvantage, I try to use it as a tool. While the so-called bee bill started off strong, it's currently stalled, leaving Scarlett even more determined to fight. We're going to win. After all, every hive needs a queen. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.